excited to be uh, launching the second half of the day. Um, I'm sure uh, we'll hear more about it later, but I, for one, was blown away by the, uh, the quality of the pitches this morning. Um, the idea for this panel is to take a little step back. Uh, we spent a lot of time this morning working and hearing from very talented um, entrepreneurs, designers, people with big visions um, about things that they want to make happen to change, change the world and improve the lives uh, of older adults through design. And uh, the Stanford team and, and, and us thought it would be nice to now hear from the other end of the spectrum, from some of the companies that are out there uh, in the market today uh, selling millions and billions of dollars of products, spanning countries around the world, um, and all of whom have a commitment and have experience and have credibility in bringing design ideas to scale. So this is really what this panel is about. In the next 45 minutes, we're going to be hearing uh, from our panelists about ways in which they think about design, way, ways in which they think about the aging market and aging population, and ways in which they are bringing in other ideas into their company in particular from users, from designers, and from startups, to really make sure that they are bringing the latest, the best thinking uh, into the market. So what we're going to do is, is have, a, I have a few questions, um, but then we're going to make sure that we have time for Q&A uh, to be able to really sort of uh, get, get a sense from the questions that we haven't asked uh, that we want to hear from, from you in the audience. Um, and ask each of the panelists to start off with uh, an introduce, introduction to themselves, about themselves and their company. Um, most of these companies, as you will hear, are sort of brand names um, that have a pretty global presence. Um, but I'm also going to ask, as they do their introductions, starting with Benjamin, uh, to also just pick one product or company or visionary solution that they like. It doesn't have to do with aging, doesn't have to do with anything, just like one product that has got uh, uh, a great design element that they that they like, and just tell us why they like that product. So, Benjamin, can you just introduce yourself, please? Uh, thank you. So, I'm just going to be the only boy, and I will start. Uh, so, I'm from uh, Orange. Orange is a European telco company. We are mainly in Europe and Africa. Uh, part of our business is really telco, as AT and T, Verizon, and stuff like that. Uh, a big part of our business is also I2 services, and we, we're basically involved in healthcare because it's more and more a problem of I2 services. Uh, the aging uh, adventure and the uh, assisted living adventure is basically in the middle of these two kind of activities because it's both how can we help organization to be more effective and how can we help people to stay in their home as long as they want. Uh, about example, I will pick an example that is uh, related to assisted living. Um, it was a, a European project, uh, so several European countries decided to work together on a social platform to help people to stay uh, connected, to maintain a social activity, and to give feedback to the, the helpers around the elderly and the people that were starting to enter the, the dependency of the fragile age. And what I really enjoyed about this project first was scale. It was designed to manage thousands of patients, and it's uh, something that is pretty scarce. And second was the ability to perform something like crowdfunding. They were actually using this platform to collect, collect information about what was happening in the, the people's life, what were the, uh, how can I say, the little accidents that were actually moving people from just being old to being fragile or to being completely dependent. And at the end of this European project, they were able to find almost 500 little daily accidents that were basically moving this person from just being old to being uh, dependent. And I think it's a, a key feature because using this somewhat dictionary of all the little life incidents, you can design something very powerful. Thank you, Benjamin. 
Alexis. Well, that's hard to follow. Um, okay, Alexis Cantor, I'm from Target. Um, we were international, we are no longer. <laughs> um, there you go. Um, <laughs> um, I'm lucky enough to lead the product development team for all of apparel and accessories, so my example is going to be very fashion oriented and not, not nearly as um, life changing. Um, but I'm actually going to choose the designers at Target that are my favorite right now because um, of all the great work they're doing, and I'm actually wearing a pair of shoes from Target. And um, you don't, you know, shoes are important, and you don't want them to hurt, and you don't want your feet to sweat, and you have to think about every bit of material. And at Target, at our price points, you have to be really, really specific about your engineering. Um, and I have to say, I'm wearing these shoes, and I've worn them my entire time right now in San Francisco, and they feel great. I don't have any blisters. My feet aren't sweaty, and it's all about the materials and the innovation, truly. Um, and to be able to do that at cost and scale, it's really, really difficult. And so I think at Target, while I love our designers, is because everything we do is with the user in mind. Because uh, you can put a great t-shirt out there, you can put a great pair of jeans, and a lot of people can do that. But we want to make sure that we're solving people's problems through that. Excellent. And we'll hear more about how you do that uh, very shortly. All right, Amber. Hi there. I'm Amber Cartwright. Um, I work at Airbnb. Everybody familiar? Yeah. Great. Uh, yay! Uh, I actually lead uh, the experience design, so the user experience for our digital products for the host side of our audience. So if you know our business model, you have travelers, which we call guests, and people who host you while you're traveling, which we call hosts. Notice we don't use users um, so that we have greater empathy with our audience. Um, and thinking about design that I admire, um, there's always a designer behind the product. and so. Something that I have really appreciated over the last few years is the jam box. That may sound silly, but I've really admired Yves Bihar, who is the designer who works at Views Project here in San Francisco. The jam box Yves has this beautiful product design, but his approach to design is what I also admire. When the jam box and the relationship that he had with that client came about, they were given one vision, one creative brief, which is how can music be more impactful to people's everyday life. And they went out and they looked and watched and observed people and how they were listening to music. And it was either a planned scenario, like I'm going to a concert, I'm going to a club, I'm going to a dinner party at someone's house, or an individual where you you know have headphones on. So why not bring music out of a planned place and make it social and bring it anywhere, which is what the jam box really does. You can go to a picnic. Um, you can take it with you while you're traveling, and it has that communal nature to it. And I really admire that in his work. Thank you. Hi, I'm Teresa Doe from LG. Um, when you think of LG, you think of all the products that you can see at Best Buy, which is part of uh, the 60 companies that LG uh, has. And uh, we have about $135 billion in revenue. So that's a large scale, but the company that I represent is LG Electronics. And uh, with LG, um, I lead the uh, techno technology partnership and investments. So I basically seek innovative technologies, uh, whether it's in the form of a startup, and uh, help introduce that to LG uh, for differentiate, uh, differentiation of our product lineup. And the other hat I wear is investments, and uh, we sit on the very strategic end of uh, investment spectrum. Uh, when it comes to my favorite product, uh, which also happened to make it to the 25 best inventions uh, voted by the Times Magazine, it's a product called Lumo, and it's a posture coach and an activity tracker. And what I really like about that product is uh, simplistic and modular design. And the other aspect of it is uh, how it's promoting longevity in a continuous basis. So uh, sitting upright, which I wasn't doing right now, <laughs> is uh, something you know you should be doing, but you forget. And uh, the product uh, helps you remind that on a continuous basis. Entire audience also shifted to the team. And I love this idea that the nudges that uh, I think we just heard in the earlier keynote about the behavioral change. Uh, I realize I didn't introduce myself, so I'm going to take 30 seconds. So, Stephen Johnston, the co founder of Aging 2.0. 
And uh, we've been collaborating with Ken and with his, the team at Stanford for the last couple of challenges, as you've heard before. So super excited uh, to have this, uh, this collaboration. And we have a global network and uh, around 10,000 people across the world uh, on an online and offline uh, network of innovators, uh, a lot of them startups focused on um, the aging market uh, and senior care. Uh, we've had about 100 events in the last uh, three years. We've created a platform with, with Katie Fike, my co-founder, and I, who unfortunately can't be here tonight. Uh, we have three other team members uh, in the audience uh, who you might well have met who uh, are based in San Francisco. Uh, and we've just did a, a quick plug for an event uh, in May. We're having a summit, which is a senior level event in, in, uh, in the middle of May in San Francisco. And we've just launched an Alliance Corporate Partner Program. So very excited to be here, to be partnering, and to be connecting the dots and, and making innovation um, and helping accelerate innovation for the senior market. My favorite product, uh, if I had a response, would be the Warby Parker uh, glasses. And I don't need glasses, and I'm, I feel a bit weird about putting glasses without any magnification on, but I just think they're really cool. I really like the fact that they're creating and scaling great design, taking a large amount of cost out of something that frankly was a bit of a, was a high margin business and was open for disruption. And I also like the fact they have a social impact. They have this idea of giving glasses to, you buy a pair and then you give a pair of glasses to somebody else in another country. So, um, so with that, I'm going to just ask the panelists um, uh, quickly in terms of this morning's um, uh, finalists to just pick one of the companies that, or sorry, one of the companies, there's me being a bit uh, overly uh, ambitious. I'm sure they will all be companies shortly. One of the, one of the presentations, just sort of pick one, uh, you know, what was interesting. It doesn't have to be a favorite. Um, and by the way, if we have three that will say the same one, perhaps the fourth one can say a different one. So pick one of the pick one of the finalists and uh, just sort of say what you found interesting about it. Who wants to start? I can kick this one off. Um, so for me, it was it, it was deeply personal and situational. So it was Think Along because um, my mom has recently had some surgery and she lives in New York. I live in Minnesota, and the idea that we could have we we used FaceTime, we did other things, but we weren't doing an activity, and I I couldn't we we could have such different conversations if we could have done that together and. It just really it, it resonated with me because of you know where I was with my family right now. I can go next. Uh, so for me, uh, the product that stood out the most was uh, Spand. So uh, when you think mobility, for me, uh, I generally think tend to think about mobility that is horizontal versus this product. The designers thought about vertical mobility. So and if. I generally felt that uh, they did a very good analysis of what the elderly required, and uh, and it also promoted uh, not only uh, vertical mobility but uh, you know, some type of exercise on a continuous basis, which is embedded into your daily life. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, when you think about great design, you have to think about it in context of what the challenges and the purpose and intent of it is. Um, so today's purpose and challenge was how impactful could it be, the criteria in the beginning. So I was really thinking about that um, with this question. And the first uh, the first one, I'm going to get the name wrong, Flip, 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 Flip. Um, I was really impressed by that in terms of the challenge um, of this particular exercise. Um, the impact that it could have is great, not just for the patients themselves, when people were having the problems, it was also impactful on the service care um, and the other side of the people uh, that are involved with that product. And I thought that, and just what it does for people um, in terms of, because I'm a sleep deprived person, saving your sleep, I was like, oh, I had empathy with that. Um, but I was, I was very impressed. Uh, being the last is tough, because, uh, oh. I think I would go for a getting active outdoor. I think getting active outdoor. Oh, yeah. I think it was the name. Pause. So yeah. the pause. And the, the reason of my choice would be um, when when you're working on assisted living, one of the <coughs> big challenges you have is you don't want to design something for the elderly because the second you end the device to them, they will say, well, I don't want that. That's for the elderly, I'm not all. <laughs> So it's, it's really a big challenge. And I think among all the ideas this morning, 
this was the only one that was uh, almost designed for all. And actually the last picture was somewhat in the mountain. And I think it's great to, uh, well, design something that could be used by anyone. But that would be handy for someone that is fragile. Thank you, Rob. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about your companies in particular. But help the audience understand more about when you think about design and you think about product creation, how do you guys do it? There's multiple different ways to skin a cat, if you like. There's lots of different ways that people can come up with products. Um, there's sort of this genius idea in a bathtub, there's quantitative research, there's um, speaking to your staff, there's speaking to the, the users. Just give us a sense of, of the kind of way the products get made, whether it's at Orange or Target or Airbnb or, or LG. I'll just start. Um, for us, I think it's it's really interesting because it starts. It's a, a combination of the trend and inspiration, and the um, kind of empathy for the user and our guest. And so I think what is a beautiful thing is how um, it's the art and science of it all and how it comes together. So when I think about our product design and development teams, it is the the beautiful mix of a designer really challenging and pushing ahead and looking, you know, going to Marrakesh and looking at, you know, a beautiful color and that inspires something in her. But then having an engineer or a product developer who brings it to life by understanding what the guest really needs. You know, you can buy a t-shirt everywhere, but when you're thinking about what a guest may need, you know, if a, uh, something that can keep you cool when you're hot and, you know, hot when you're cold. I mean, those are things that are fabric innovations, and it's an, it's just amazing when you can combine what is so inspiring out there in the world with um, true needs of the guest. And so we try to get our product um, as we're developing it in the hands of a lot of people. We do in-home user testing, and it really depends on what type of exploratory or validation type of work we're doing, but it is just it blasts through assumptions in such a fast way when you're talking to people who are actually going to use your product and use it in a way that they do versus assuming how you think they want it. Um, and it has changed how we develop product. It has changed how successful we are with keeping our, um, product in stores and, and just really resonating in a, in a relevant way with our guests. Mm -hmm. so, so when you design products, do you come up with this wonderful idea and then the business people come along and say, no, 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 that's too expensive, rethink it. How do you work with your business um, colleagues? Um, so we, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge um, being on the art side and the science side being your merchants who have a line plan and a business plan and um, margins to hit. And you know, as somebody who is a product engineer, we think a lot about the design to value and what components are important and what, you, what can come out of it and won't be a miss to anyone and what can't. And often we talk about uh, where people should have um, have reach in our in our products, and we often say, um, you may have an opinion about the external, but we're going to work on the internal. So that really, when you think about scale or you think about cost, there's a lot of things you can do to take things out without sacrificing quality or guest experience. So um, it is an amazing balance, and there's a lot of healthy conflict at, at Target, so that we're talking, and I think that's the best thing, right? I'm. I could be pushing for things all day long, but I have to listen to that business perspective um, because we're a business and we're running a business and, and it is that, that healthy conflict that makes our actual end product better because it, to me, the best innovation comes from a diversity of voices. And so when I'm talking to a merchant or I'm talking to a designer or I'm talking to someone who's in sourcing, that is gonna help me come at this with a much better perspective for, for the needs. So if a designer came to you, they shouldn't be worried that they don't have their product bill of materials is too high because you could collaborate with them to yeah. figure out. And, and I think what's fun is we don't, we let designers be designers, so if they have this beautiful idea, that product engineer is going to be that one who then makes it happen. I mean, I have a funny example from when I was at Victoria's Secret and this designer had this amazing jacquard and she wanted it in a bodysuit and I'm, that was the 90s. And, um, it, <laughs> and it had zero stretch and she didn't want to put any type of opening in it. And it was just really interesting to balance understanding what she was really looking for and then delivering something in a different way, but it, it solved the problem. 
So, I'm a, I, I, I don't know if you spoke about this the other day. I, I feel that um, Airbnb is a real uh, genius when it comes to branding and design because you're the, I think, probably the, the largest provider of accommodation in the world right now with 800,000. Yes, pretty much uh, 800,000 rooms and Inter Intercontinental has yes. 700,000. So you don't own any of them. They're not your rooms. And yet, how do you think about design when you don't even own the rooms that you are famous for? So design um, and how we think about that and how we've always thought about our digital product um, is, is, is the fastest way to get through to enable that offline experience. We actually celebrate the uniqueness of people's homes. That's our, that is our whole product, is that you actually, when you stay with people, you get their personality, you get their unique flavor, you understand that local culture. So it's something we celebrate and that we encourage. Um, but within the digital products, we want to, you know, as we went through our rebranding exercise last year, like, what is our identity? Um, how can we take that identity to scale internationally, but also realize that this is just a service to enable those experiences that you have on the other side. Um, so that's kind of the approach is like, how can we create, you know, the least amount of friction to enable something that is unique? How, how would you describe your sort of brand values at Airbnb? And is, it, is design central to them? Absolutely. I mean, it starts with our founders. Um, the two founders are designers from RISD. Um, and uh, to, the, to the question earlier about um, the process, it, it really it came out of need. So the two founders, they were at RISD, they decided to move to the Bay to live the dream. You know, we're going to come up with the big idea. For them, it, it worked. Um, but <laughs> what happened was they, they had been trying for so long, you know, had no money, and they were in their apartment on Rouse Street. And out of their need of making money, they're like, oh, there's a design conference in town. Why don't we just put our air mattress on the floor and we'll you know, rent out our space to some of these people we already know in the design conference. Um, so it, it, you know, it came out of, out of that. And so that we have at our core design as a part of our philosophy. Our space is um, interior design for, for openness. Um, we also are pushed to have design at the core of our thinking when we're coming up with ideas. Um, and Ryan, who is our CEO, is a very interesting CEO because he does have a design-minded you know, way of thinking. Like He can think really high level and visionary, but also kind of be in the weeds, which is what really good designers can do. So Teresa, from LG, maybe you could give us a sense of, of how you think about finding new uh, products and services more broadly. I know that you're involved in the investment side and with innovations, and you've got a lot of activities and uh, programs that you open up LG to startups, for example. So just talk us a little bit about how you interface uh, with startups and, and new products and new services that you see in the market. Um, so in contrast to Airbnb, we have a more uh, traditional business model of uh, you know, uh, selling hardware mostly and um, so we also take we take that traditional approach of uh, gathering a uh, voice of customer on a very continuous basis and you know it's at the beginning of the product life cycle and also at the end of the product life cycle so that goes on a continuous basis and uh, how we do how we go about doing that is uh, there's the monitoring of the new trends, so what's uh, irrelevant to our products, uh, what's what's trending, uh, what do people care about nowadays. So that's there's that part of the market research and there's also a direct market research uh, based on uh, consumer feedback that is uh, geared towards our products. So we integrate them together and uh, one thing we, uh, we are careful about in integrating this is there's a difference between what consumers say that they want versus what they really want. Or they might not know, or nobody might know what would be the new need. So uh, we're uh, careful about that. And um, so this is going on on the headquarters side. Uh, what we do out of the Silicon Valley, because this is an area where you know there's so many innovations, uh, we uh, partner with different organizations here. So, you know, Stanford University is one. Uh, we interact with other universities on the East Coast as well. And uh, government agencies, uh, technology accelerators, incubation programs. 
We're also, uh, we also have a close tie with Orange. Um, and uh, so we uh, share information about uh, which companies, which startups are uh, uh, spurting, sprouting, and uh, we seek them out and uh, evaluate where is a where there's a fit with our existing portfolio, and uh, we introduce them. And uh, the evaluation cycle tends to be lengthy, uh, being a large company. However, uh, if in a successful case, it takes about a year, a year and a half, to be introduced to our product portfolio. And and this could be in the form of a technology partnership, so licensing, uh, royalty, or an RE type of format, or it could be an investment form uh, as well. So, uh, following up to Reza's point, uh, and to you, Benjamin, uh, if sometimes if you ask consumers, they don't really know what they want, and if you ask the consumers at the end of the last century, famously, they would have asked for faster horses. Uh, in a technology business like, uh, like what Orange is in, and things are moving so quickly, it's hard to really imagine the future in you know, two years, let alone five years. Uh, so how do, you, how do you do that? Do you ask consumers, or do you just tell them what they well, want? Well, we, we used to do that a lot. And, well, since you don't know what you don't know, we, we don't do that a lot anymore. Um, the, the way we work uh, most of the time is we are not a product company, we, we, we sell services. So uh, the really important part of the design is the customer journey. So uh, from, from the beginning, how do you learn about this product to the end? How can you have you know, troubleshooting management and stuff for this service and so on? The, the only way that really works for us is to take the innovation and put it in the market and have real feedback from the customer because you have a service but you have everything that goes around the service. Uh, for example, this, this morning we were talking about uh, the handlebar uh, and uh, obviously at some point you need to, uh, to have someone that will install the device in the, the customer house and well, that's a pain. You will have to send someone and to pierce into the wall to, to fix the stuff and so on. And that is part of the customer journey. That is really important to have feedback on that because at the end of the day, this is the kind of stuff that will uh, make your customer happy or unhappy. And coming back to what people were talking about this morning, I think a huge part of this uh, design and, and, and feedback collection is about culture. We are involved in, in culture. culture, yeah, culture. Sorry about my English uh, culture. So we're involved in, in 22 countries in Africa. And honestly, the kind of product we launch in Europe are completely different from the one we launch in Africa. So working with Darren, we, we, we try to find uh, uh, innovative company in, in the valley. And we just launch the product, let's say in Botswana, and see how it behaves. Yeah. Like it well, maybe we go from Botswana to Ivory Coast and to Cameroon and so on. And, and the mobile industry, they're quite famous for this idea of reverse innovation where we get more innovation. I can pay if I'm in a supermarket line in, in uh, Kenya, I can pay friends who are standing next to me by my mobile phone much easier than I can if I'm standing in the, uh, the Whole Foods here in, uh, in Palo Alto. There's much more innovation at the service level, it seems. So, you know, how do you cope with a slow-moving industry? Because, you know, no offense, but healthcare and, the take <laughs> healthcare and telco operators are not famous for being great bastions of design or innovation. So is this something that you can, yeah, how do you do that? Is it going to Africa and figuring out what works there, bringing it back? Or how do you cope with a very slow-moving regulated industry? Thank you for this question. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, I don't think we can compare what is right now in Africa, especially in the healthcare market. It's not regulated, so we don't have any, you know, timeline issues. 
we decided three months ago that we wanted to launch uh, some, some kind of artificial intelligence to perform triage in Botswana, and we've been doing it in three months. Uh, last summer we decided we wanted to launch what we call Healthline, basically medical call center to help people touch with a nurse in Cameroon, and the agreement with the Ministry of Health was a matter of weeks. So, well, if you're prepared to pay for the administration process, can be very quick. So, I was any PR people from Orange right now. You didn't say that. There was no bribery implied or assumed. I did not say bribery. <laughs> On the other hand, when it comes to Europe or United States, uh, yes, we're slow, but our customers are even slower. So. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, to be fair and honest, we respect, we respect the French uh, honesty. Um, no, I think it's really interesting actually, from, coming from the UK myself, there's a lot of uh, the health system uh, arbitrage, I think, that we can think through when it comes to implementing some of these. And, and one of the things that we see with some of our startups is that they go, especially the ones that need a bit more regulation and, and um, sort of government oversight, they actually find the European market more effective as a, as a place to launch and to get some of those certifications and then bring them back uh, to, the, to the American health market. Uh, I want to shift gears a little bit towards of aging specifically, and I, I, I know that, Teresa, you worked with some products uh, specifically for the aging market, uh, but even if you haven't, just sort of give us a sense from you know, how you think through uh, the, the concept of uh, marketing and targeting the space, because, and here's, here's one suggestion, now, is it a market, or is it really just there are people and some of them have different needs? So maybe Teresa, why don't you start up with some of the products and services that you've already been uh, working with? Uh, so LG back in the feature phone days, um, we had a series of phone lineup called the Wine series. So get that be get better with age. It was a concept behind it, uh, and. Uh, after the first launch, so I'll uh, go over the product concept first. So it's not rocket science, but uh, the uh, silver segment have different needs uh, when it comes to communication. And back in those days, um, there was a hurdle to start using phones. And uh, we, you know, we uh, made very simple changes, like uh, providing large font as the default uh, setting, um, providing uh, larger keypads. Yes, we had keypads back then. And um, also uh, enabling uh, multimedia features that were you know, popular or uh, that, were, that uh, the age community were more familiar with. So features like you know, enabling FM radio or uh, TV on the phone, which uh, was uh, very popular, and uh, we made about four iterations. So there's wine one, wine two, wine three, up till four, and uh, there was also a wine sherbet version. So we addressed that market, and uh, what we learned from it is that uh, the end consumer, the end user, are the uh, so was the silver segment, but the people who actually purchase it were the children. So it is actually a, a significant market. Uh, and uh, you know, we have a um, reverse pyramid uh, and when it comes to age segments. So I think it's a growing market. And uh, that was on our LG, LG Electronics business uh, unit side. On the other side, uh, one of our uh, sister companies, LG U Plus, which is uh, Korean telco, um, they, uh, we have, they have, um, pricing plan called the silver plan and so it's basically the plan whether it be a text uh, data or you know video telephony it's optimized for an average uh, average uh, aged person and uh, the discount is very large and um, Korea being a very uh, Korea being a culture where we have a lot of respect for the elderly you know uh, even if it's not optimal business-wise, um, we uh, take into consideration other um, uh, larger values and uh, there is a very, uh, it's a very affordable plan 
geared towards that segment. Thank you. Uh, maybe Amber, from Airbnb's perspective, many people would assume that the older segment wouldn't actually embrace this crazy idea of renting out your home to complete strangers. Uh, but I think the data may be a little, little different, is that right? That is right. Um, I, I can't remember which group was, was talking this morning, but one of the bigger problems with um, an aging audience is a loneliness factor and living alone. So actually the prospect of Airbnb um, we have found to be very successful with that audience. I mean, they're meeting new people, making connections, um, and that has been such a great thing um, to have um, for that audience. Um, in terms of like how we think about designing for them, some of the things that we that we do, uh, it is it has been very common feedback on, on some of the things that you mentioned. Um, wanting high contrast in colors on screens, wanting larger fonts, um, not using some of the new conventions and trends and buttons, like using icons for things that may not mean anything. Like actually use the language on the button itself. Um, so I think we think about it almost every day, like when we're designing them and, and making sure that we are using those those core principles um, within it. Thank you. Uh, Alexis, I keep on seeing uh, Iris Apple, the 90-something-year-old uh, model for uh, one of the beauty brands, uh, which is this, some really interesting uh, shifts I think we're seeing in the market in fashion uh, and apparel. Uh, one of the companies that we've got in our accelerator program this year, it's called Narrative Apparel, is working on something which seems obvious to me, but it, it's, it's function and form. It's, it's having products, having um, clothing that does the necessary functional requirements, but actually also look, look beautiful. So do you guys at all um, think, you know, how do you think about um, demographics? And do you design, so once people get past 60, say, okay, we've got to make you look ugly? Or how, does it, how, how do you think about it? Everybody needs to look beautiful. Because when you look good, you feel more confident, right? And so at Target, we have several different brands, and each brand has a brand principle. And in those brand principles, we really look at the age range we think this brand hits. And so we have a couple brands at Target that are very, very democratic. Democratic, and so when you're doing that, you have to get that product in the hands of all the users, then, right? And we have been really surprised by how willing all ages are to um, test out and give feedback. And and what we have found is there's just so many similarities. When you want to look good, you want to feel good, you want to feel like your clothes are a solution. Everybody's looking for a solution, and so if you can base it on that, I think we've we've had some some success. And it's interesting because. You, it, it doesn't matter on the age range. Like you do that same great work for kids. You know, when you think about kids' product, you I was saying this to Amber, you can't have anything on that product that bothers a kid um, with their tactile senses or or makes them not you know concentrate in school or focus on their own development. You, their, their clothes have to provide this great sense of I don't even feel it. It just does everything I need. And I think that's the same thing with every age group that needs something from a product. You have to be really thoughtful about what is that lifestyle, what is really, really important, and that could come from fabric innovation, that could come from fit, construction, um, you know, compression. I think there's all different ways to think about it. And so we're really thoughtful about our brands and where we think the brands can span. Thank you. Uh, okay, we're coming into the end of the session, um, I realize I've done a very bad job of involving you guys uh, to ask questions, so I do apologize. Um, I have one more question, uh, unless anybody is absolutely burning uh, in the audience. Great. In that case, my, my question is a... <laughs> my, my question is a magic wand question, I'm going to start with Benjamin. Uh, if you could wave a magic wand and remove any of the barriers or challenges that stand in the way of scaling beautiful design, brilliant innovation, uh, what would you do? How would you, what barrier would you, would you remove standing in the way uh, of brilliant design and brilliant innovation? Uh, let's say we, we talk, we're still talking about uh, aging in place and stuff like that, distribution. That is the main challenge uh, I think we have. Because even if we have a wonderful idea, being able to actually perform on the market and to get inside the eyes of customers is really difficult. And it's not related to design, actually. It's really related to pure distribution problems. 
Mike, it's so interesting that you say that as a big corporation, we have exactly the same complaint from the startups that we work with. So it's, it's a universal problem. Alex, how about you? to be as inspiring as the work being done here today. But um, if I could maybe wave a magic wand, I'm a huge believer that co-creation is the future for apparel and fashion. And um, as a somebody who understands pattern making and how to manufacture clothes, I don't mind getting onto a site and, and figuring out how I have to, you know, figure out my measurements and do different things. But if I could make, you know, wave the wand tomorrow, I would make it super, super simple for, for guests to get online and really create their own garments because to me that's really where the beauty lands and, and how do we make that accessible. And I think at Target, you know, we're so known for design for all that this is just another way for our, us to leapfrog and really think about the future and, and the needs there. And I think about it from a sustainability standpoint because if we're making less samples and we're and we're you know using less water, then we're we're doing a better thing. If we're you know transporting less product, and we really make it about um, supply, you know, changing up the supply chain and going after what truly that guest wants. I mean, think about it. You're not making a bazillion T-shirts that are never going to get worn or going to land somewhere in you know the landfill. You are doing exactly what that guest wants, and it, it is based on their preference and their style, and and that to me is great fashion. It's a wonderful idea. It's a bit like Nike designing their own uh, footwear. You heard it here first, folks. Target making uh, making your own wardrobe. Wonderful. Amber? Um, I guess my magic wand um, for the challenges that we have in designing at scale, I would just magic wand away consistency. Because what we have to do is think about hundreds of different types of audiences you know, all around the world but we're trying to keep a very consistent brand identity and design within a system. So as a designer, when you're given a problem, there's like a million ways that you can solve that problem. Um, and to be constrained into having to think about, well, it has to be solved in a very specific way. Um, it makes it very challenging to stay within that constraint. Um, so where you could just, like, this is that problem. There's a brilliant interface for that, but oh, we don't actually support that kind because it doesn't work on IE8, for example, because that's what a lot of people use in other countries. So get rid of consistency and we can focus on each individual person and design for them would be what I would love. I love it. Theresa. Uh, so I like how you phrased your question, uh, which threw me off a little bit because <laughs> I had a different thing in mind. However, um, uh, representing an electronics company, I think our biggest challenge that we like to solve is uh, power, efficient power. And uh, you know we have so much wasted energy, solar, kinetic energy, and there's different uh, technologies that is uh, beginning to sprout. Um, however, yeah, if you know we had an you know eternal source of energy, I think there could be so much um, more that we could do and provide to the consumers. Fantastic, great answers all. So just as I as I leave you all. As expert designers and, and, and people with big ideas, can they get in contact with you and how do they reach you? Everybody's open for that? Excellent. Well, you heard it here first. Just, pick, pick, just come, come, and, come and meet them, connect them with your ideas. Uh, I want to say thank you very much uh, to the panel and uh, looking forward to the next session. Thank you.